Welcome back to Teach Amanda Fish Channel. Get ready to go on a sizzling journey. It's going to tantalize your taste buds and ignite your culinary creativity. And in this video, we're going to be covering some of the secrets and tips and some of the steps that you can take to make mouth-watering burgers. You'll be the hero of the outdoor backyard cooking for your parties and your friends. Get your tongs and your spatulas ready. This is gonna be more than just a cooking video. It's going to teach you the ins and outs of working with your grill. And remember this, the one who's holding the spatula is the king or queen of the grill. Everyone else knows it. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll break this video up into numerous chapters that'll be listed down below. If you wanna jump to any specific tip or trick or we're covering something that you already know, it'll be listed out there so you can scan through the video quick for what you need. You've got a couple of choices when you're selecting your meat, what type of meat you're gonna use. The basic and the easiest way, I recommend 80-20. Fat is flavor, that 20% fat in the meat adds that flavor, but there are problems that come with that. You've got shrinkage. Shrinkage. Yes. <laughs> Significant shrinkage. Because uh, some of that fat can drop out, and that's where you end up getting that hockey puck. We'll talk about how to fight that in a bit. You've also got flare-ups. If you don't know your grill well, and the you're learning the skills and techniques on each individual piece of, of equipment because it's different, you're learning those skills to prevent the flare-up. That 20% can be a, a flare-up scenario. Yeah, there's a flare-up. Let's take a second and talk about gas versus charcoal and some of the things that you can do to improve your burgers with if you're using a gas grill. We're going to be using a Lodge Sportsman's grill in this video because we found between the cast iron and how we can control the fire. We know that grill very well. We can prevent the flare-ups. You get that smoke flavor. If you're using a gas grill to make your hamburger, there's tools and devices that you can use to load up. And this is one of our favorites. And we use this when we're using the gas grill as well. This, you pack this with wood pellets or charcoal or lump charcoal bits, light that with a torch, put that in your gas grill as you're cooking it, or just before you start to cook it, load it up with the meat and let that smoke settle in on the meat for a bit. And you'll get some of that true smoke flavor that you typically might not get with your standard gas grill. It makes a difference. People will, and you will notice it, even if you're just cooking for yourself, you'll notice that smoke flavor in the hamburger that just gives it that one more notch of mouth-watering deliciousness. We're actually going to create a flare-up to show you what you can do in order to keep it from getting burned. Too much fire on those burgers is not good. You can recover from it. It's just a, a quick reacting step, and you've got to be paying attention. The higher you go in lean, the less likely you'll get those flare-ups on that grill. Another choice that you have with meat selection is going ahead and buying that whole muscle or that whole cut and grinding it yourself. Again, you kind of want to get your fattier meats, your cheaper meats, and this KitchenAid grinder that we have is fantastic at doing a quick, easy cleanup after finished. Does a great job with the grind. It's not something that we use when we're doing large batches, for example, say a whole deer, but for one quick chuck roast steak like this, it really does a great grind. You truly do get a better quality product when you're picking out your cut. You can gauge the fat. We also see here you can do a double grind and that adds a little bit better tenderness and you're getting if there is any kind of gristle or tendon in that cut of meat you'll get it ground up a, just a little bit better by doing a double grind through your smaller plate. I'll give you one last tip here something that somebody told me is if you grab a piece of bread and make certain of that the last thing you run through is a piece of bread and you discard it but it clears out the fat and grease and makes it a little bit easier during the cleanup process. You also squeeze the last bits of your meat out. In the next tip, let's talk about the spices. 
You want your burger to taste like beef. A lot of people start to add spices in there that end up either borderline making it taste like meatloaf or completely disguising the flavor of the burger. We keep our spices really simple with salt, pepper, onion, very, very light garlic because it's it can be overpowering and even chopped onions. We'll talk about the chopped onions in just a second and why they're important, but that's it. And even light at that, I don't like breaking out your barbecue rub spices, all these spices that mask the, the flavor of the beef. Simple, salt, black pepper, onion, garlic. You'll notice that this is probably one of the most significant tricks or secrets that we have. We have this meat laid out in uh, about a three quarter of an inch layer, and that's important in several ways. You'll notice we left plenty of air space inside there. We put the spices on across that layer about the same thickness that we would season a three quarter inch steak. It's just meat. If you think about that, most of us are used to, this is the seasoning level that we like or the salt or the pepper on a three quarter inch steak. If you season to that level, you'll be making a, a burger that's not too salty, not too peppery, not too garlicky. Your seasonings re remain at the proper level. You'll notice at this point that we're going to take this meat and we're going to be lifting it up and folding it over and mashing it down. We're not doing any of that kneading motion that drives all those air pockets out of the meat. You want those spaces and those gaps to reside as much as you can in your final burger. It's like a balance between the burger not falling apart and the gaps being in there for the, the juice and the fat in order to have a like a sponge, a place to reside inside that burger. If you're mashing and mixing that together, you've almost got a putty or a paste and you're, if you think of your burger, it ends up having the texture and the taste in the same way, like you cooked it as a, a solid block or a brick of putty or paste. Here's another tip for you. The thickness of your burger matters in how you do the cooking. When it's very thick, just like a steak, it cooks slower. You don't have to be quite as attentive, but I can tell you when it's thinner, it's a, it's a bit easier of a cook because it happens fast, you're done, you, you pull it off. You gotta pay closer attention though, because it is fat. Another critical tip here, while we're making these patties, is if you look at how we make that, we make the circle or the patty first, and then we pat into the middle of each of these patties. We're kind of making it like a donut, almost a hole, but no hole. And the outer ring is a little bit fatter. When that hamburger wants to shrink up, it's got room to shrink into the center and it won't turn into a, a meatball on your, your grill. Let's talk about temperature for a second because that's one of the, the main Google searches for hamburgers is what temperature do you cook it to? I can tell you with absolute safety and certainty, 160 degrees internal in the center of the burger will kill everything in the meat. However, in my opinion, you're starting to get up above where you're anything over that and you're going to be losing those juices and that tenderness. And I'm a big, not a big fan of overdone meat. The whole comments around shoe leather end up coming up and you're making hockey pucks and things like that. The problem with hamburger that you purchase in the store is the interior of a, a slab of meat is sterile. The, the contamination in the bacteria resides around the outside of the meat. Within the store setting, when you grind that meat up, you're now taking that bacteria and inside the grind, it's in the middle. You don't know how long that's been sitting there. You don't know the story behind it. You don't know what meat was ground up into it. So in that circumstance, you have to cook full sick, thick, bah. You have to cook full thickness, 160 degree temperature in order to ensure that bacteria and contamination that was in the center of that meat gets killed. When you're using that second option and grinding your own whole muscle, you kind of know the story of that meat. Yes, there could be contamination in there, but when you cook that whole muscle on the grill, all that contamination on the outside will get killed because of the searing process. 
but especially if you harvest it yourself and you know how it was handled, the temperature that was kept at, and you know the full story behind the meat, I feel doubly safe for cooking for somewhere around 130, 135, where you're getting right around that medium temperature to uh, even a little bit higher than that, 140, 145, medium well temperatures for your burger. And you get to keep those juices in the burger. So you cook to a lesser temperature. If you grind your meat yourself, you also kind of know the story of what the contamination was and the story behind it. So it's a bit less risky to cook to less than that 160. But if you have any doubt about the contamination or the possibility, you need to be cooking that meat full thickness up to the 160 degrees. Well, here we are ready to, to roll with our burgers. And if you remember when we were making these, they were a bit crumbly, but when you let them set in the fridge like that, they, they dry out a hair, the beef meat flavor intensifies and you get a more solid burger after a couple of hours of maturing in that refrigerator. Let's talk about this dehydrated onion for a second. You can use, we like onions in our burgers. You can put them on the exterior, which we also do with red onion. Red onion is our favorite. But with this dried onion, you also have the opportunity to, that onion will absorb the juices in the meat and take on the, some of the fat and the flavor in the cooking process will reside in that onion as it reconstitutes in your burger. The problem with using raw onions or cut up onions in your burger is when it cooks, if you envision that, that onion encased in meat, it's going to sweat. And when that onion sweats, it creates a little liquid pocket that is not real conducive to number one, keeping the burger together, but you kind of don't want water in your burger. You want the flavor and the fat in the burger this is another question that comes up in relation to how long or the time temperature that you're cooking the hamburger to. It's all about temperature. You know your equipment or you'll learn your equipment. Forget about time. If I could save time in a bottle. Time has zero impact on whether or not that burger is done to the right rate. You could have your temperature way high and you could turn that thing into a hockey puck in a matter of minutes. You could have your temperature really low and you're conservative and it's, it's kind of hard to overdo it, but you just slowly cook that until you hit the temperature that you're aiming for and you pull it off. Who cares what that time is? So we already mentioned we're going to be using the Lodge Sportsman's Grill, but we've got two options. In our kitchen out here, we've got the old versus the new, and I think we're gonna go with the Sportsman's Pro. The, the, actually, the layout is a bit better for putting burgers in through here, as opposed to getting caught up in the rounded edges here. So new is a little bit better than old in this scenario. While that charcoal is getting going and, and getting prepped up, let's talk a little bit about the grill. You've got to know where your hot spots are and how you control your O2 or your oxygen. Feeding that fire with that oxygen and it getting too hot is what causes those flare-ups. So starving it of oxygen, you can always add oxygen and increase the heat as the cook goes on. So keeping that in mind, start with your dampers closed off, open it up. The minute you start to feel, think, see that you're starting to head towards those flare-ups, choke it back off from oxygen. Don't start with too many coals or too much heat because you'll get a flare up and you'll have to immediately move into other measures in order to stop that flare up. Now that we've got those coals going, we're gonna let the grill settle out, do a little bit of grill grate prep work, which just means throwing some oil on and getting the grates cleaned up. So we've got room left in the heat. This is what we were talking about, the exact scenario that you want. I can add a little bit of oxygen into this and gently increase my heat and have it not get away from me and result in flare-ups. Knowing my grill the way I do, I have to do a rotation from the, the outer edge, which is a little bit more cool than the inner edge. And about halfway through the cook, if I just do a rotation, that evens that out. 
again, you got to learn to know your equipment. This is also a good point to talk about when you move anything, it's prone to flare up. Give it a second to watch and see what happens, especially when you're doing a flip. And never, ever, ever do that press where you end up pressing the juices out of the meat. Some people you'll see, they'll start pressing on the meat and causing all that flame. You wanna kind of avoid all that flame. Flame isn't really good flavor. When you start to see that blood coming through the meat, that's when it's time to flip. And again, a really highly likelihood that you're gonna have a flare up in that scenario. This fire's getting a bit hot too. I've got the O2 all the way cut off. I'm gonna keep an eye on whether or not I need to pull them off or shuffle them around the grill. Yeah, there's a flare up. Once you see that flare up occur, the, the clock is ticking. You can move everything to a cooler part of the grill or what we did here is we had a plate ready to go and we transitioned over to the so plate. That's where we talked about where you need to have an option to back off let that fire settle down. And I'm gonna go ahead and say this, avoid your frozen pre-made burgers at all costs, like a Bubba burger. They end up tasting like wax to me, they smell awful, they're prone to flare up, it's cheap meat, avoid them. And you can go back to it. Now that that fire has settled back down a little bit, you can move those burgers back over start cooking them again without running the risk of turning them into hockey pucks. Mm -hmm. Now this video isn't a whole lot about the toppings and bread type options, but the, the selection is limitless. The, you're only limited by your imagination. You can even do a double decker low carb variety. So YouTube says that this video is perfect for your viewing habits. This is my latest upload and over here is a playlist you might just enjoy. I hope you liked it. If you did, please click like, subscribe, share, and come on back for more.